I am Cindy Weatherby, and since 2015, uh, I've volunteered as the League of Women Voters of Texas Chair of the Voting Rights and Election Law Advocacy, and I'm extremely honored to moderate this extraordinary panel to help us all get multiple perspectives on a most extraordinary year in the legislature. Uh, also, extra thanks to the League of Women Voters of Austin and League of Women Voters of Texas President Grace Shemaine for this opportunity. Uh, League of Women Voters of Austin always plays a big role in the legislative advocacy, given its location, and so do neighbor local leagues in Hayes County, Kamal, Hill Country too. And this year, local leagues all across the state have as well, all 34 local leagues, as we've had almost 250,000 individual contacts to the legislature by our members and our um, associates that use our platform. Uh, if you'll go to the next slide. Our time is really short and I know that this presentation is gonna zoom through really quickly in the next hour. So um, I just wanted to give you a quick overview of who you're going to be honored to listen to today. Uh, our first pres uh, panelist is going to talk about the historical perspective of this very unusual legislative session, the 87th session of the Texas legislature this year in 2021. Harvey Kronberg is the publisher of the Quorum Report. It was a pioneer of online political publishing, and he has reported on the Texas legislature since 1989. QR is the oldest political insider's newsletter. And as you see here, he is widely respected and revered and we're very honored to have him here today. Next, we're gonna hear from one of the stars of the legislature for voting and uh, election law. And that is John Busey. John is the state representative for district 136 elected in 2018. And since that time has served on the house elections committee. Uh, he works on behalf of voters and has been extremely successful in working across the aisle to make improvements to uh, our voting uh, election uh, code. Uh, we're also very honored to have Isabel Longoria, who is Harris County's first elections administrator. She's in that role responsible for both voter registration and elections administration and has has the uh, honor and uh, experience of creating creative solutions, uh, addressing pandemic related barriers in 2020 and beyond. Uh, if you've watched any of the online Texas legislature online uh, public hearings that the Senate or the House had on major elections bills, you've seen Ms. Longoria ably presenting the information about how Harris County took care of its voters. And then lastly, we're very honored to have Thomas Buser Clancy. Uh, Tommy is a, an ACLU senior staff attorney, and you may not know that name, but you certainly do know his work. Uh, he's very active in a new lawsuit challenging Senate Bill 1 in this second legislative special session on behalf of the League of Women Voters of Texas and the, dis, uh, the community of those with disabilities through Rev Up Texas and other organizations. He was also involved in that lawsuit settlement that uh, ended the Texas Secretary of State purge of nearly 100,000 voters in 2019. So we're, we're very happy to have each of them cover their perspectives on the regular 87th session and also the three so far special sessions. And I'll ask Mr. Kromberg to begin with putting the 87th session into historical perspective. We're going to hold questions for a general Q&A at the end. So Mr. Kromberg. Thank you very much for having me. Um, I presume everybody can hear me just, uh, just fine. Uh -huh. um, uh, in 15 minutes, I'm going to try and give you a context uh, for what, what has happened in this last uh, last session, or this last series of sessions, frankly. First of all, you need to know that, um, that since the Republican takeover of the state, 
um, the Republican perception of their constituency has been essentially uh, complete reliance on seven suburban counties. That's like Hayes, Williamson, Fort Bend, Montgomery. Um, Tarrant is a, kind of the outlier there, but Collin County. These colonies of uh, uh, counties have been so Republican that uh, from the uh, uh, perspective of any campaign, uh, they didn't even do micro targeting. They would just do saturation bombing of advertising, block walking, et cetera. And at least as far as state statewide races were concerned, um, they would uh, presume that they were gonna get 70% turnout and 70% would vote Republican. Add to that the reliably Republican rules and uh, that has been kind of the cornerstone of, uh, of uh, state public policy um, uh, for the last 20 years. But to put that into context, um, we're a state now of 30 million people, uh, but because of the, A, the disorganization of the Democrats, B, the, um, the uh, funding advantage of the Republicans, uh, the, um, the only election that has mattered for the most part in the last 20 years has been the Republican primary. So we're a state of 30 million people uh, typically, you might get a turnout of 1.5, maybe we're growing a little bit, 1.7 million uh, Republican primary voters, uh, which is another way of saying that is about 850,000 uh, individual voters um, have uh, uh, control over state policy, over state uh, elections. Um, so about 850,000 in a state of 30 million uh, uh, control the levers of power. Uh, the, um, and as a result, obviously, they've controlled redistricting, et cetera. Uh, the world is changing somewhat. Uh, in the last couple of elections, we saw, uh, well, in the 2018 election, we saw essentially a, a democratic uh, sweep um, uh, in some of these uh, uh, rock-ribbed Republican counties. Um, and so now, all of a sudden, uh, the, the, what the once reliable formula for Republicans has come into question, and we're gonna see some pretty creative map drawing in this next redistricting cycle um, as they um, uh, try and hold on to their majorities, create super majorities, but they're gonna to have to have tendrils going into rural, from the suburbs into rural Texas. Um, and it's not at all uh, reliable. Uh, typically in a redistricting cycle, we expect it to be about three or four election cycles before uh, the minority party starts to uh, win uh, or increase its numbers um, because of the changing demographics of the state and the rightward tilt of the Republican Party in this last election cycle. It would not surprise me to see that's accelerated going forward. The things you need to know are that uh, pretty much every session is dominated by the big three, the uh, governor, the lieutenant governor, and the speaker. Uh, the governor, Governor Abbott, uh, followed uh, uh, Governor Perry, um, and I'm not being partisan to say that he has not demonstrated a big vision for where to take Texas. Uh, the, um, uh, unlike uh, Governor Perry, who uh, at one time endorsed the Trans-Texas Corridor and had some big vision, uh, the Texas Enterprise Fund, um, uh, Governor Perry built a um, what might some call an economic development machine. Uh, that has not been the primary focus of Governor Abbott. Uh, in fact, his biggest initiative in his first legislative session was pre-K, uh, creating and funding pre-K. He um, uh, got so much pushback from the Republican primary uh, voters uh, who called it uh, babysitting, nanny state, social uh, um, brainwashing, that um, although he passed it, they did not fund it particularly uh, with a sufficient amount of money. And ever since then, he's been somewhat risk averse about being challenged on the right. Uh, he's a fundraising machine, however, with sitting with $50 million in the bank. And uh, while not particularly popular in the House or Senate uh, uh, because he's primary, he's funded primaries against Republicans, uh, he's uh, vetoed their budget, um, the $50 million is, um, uh, is pretty persuasive when everything is said and done. Um, but uh, he has, uh, uh, for most of his term of office, been more worried about being pursued by uh, Dan Patrick, the lieutenant governor, um, who uh, has um, un, un, um, unchallenged conservative credentials. Now, when I say conservative credentials, conservative 10 years ago 
meant uh, pro-business and socially conservative. Um, but uh, the business community has essentially been under assault by the populist wing of the Republican Party and is somewhat mystified about how to deal with it. Uh, the big tech companies are the, the uh, 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 social platforms, uh, social engagement platforms are under attack. They're being accused of being biased, et cetera. Um, um, uh, essentially, um, uh, most, of, most of the last couple of sessions have been uh, more focused on, on socially conservative issues. Um, the, uh, he was the uh, author, champion, and um, uh, a, a major promoter of the bathroom bill, which actually was a seismic moment in Texas politics. The bathroom bill, as you may recall, every session has something that's, that it, it becomes a metaphor for that session. Um, nobody remembers what happened in the 2017 session, except that there was this bathroom bill. It started out with about a 65% approval and ended up with about a 65% disapproval as people found out more and more about it. And it became an embarrassment, frankly, for the Republican Party, which uh, ultimately led to a um, uh, surprise gain of, I can't now remember if it was eight or nine Democrats in the uh, 2018 election. Most of those victories were not anticipated. They were not um, uh, predicated on any, any kind of polling. In fact, in some cases, the, uh, the Democratic challengers didn't even really work. They just happened to be there when the opportunity came along. Uh, Governor Patrick is um, rules with each passing session. He has increased his control over the uh, uh, over the Senate. He did that partially by uh, 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 well, we call it busting a chairman. Uh, Senator Kel Seliger, once a once powerful senator from Amarillo, uh, was insulted by one of uh, Patrick's staffers. He returned the insult. And uh, the governor, lieutenant governor, then um, uh, removed him from uh, significant chairmanships and committee assignments. That would never have happened before Patrick. Um, and the, in prior to Patrick, the senators ran the Senate, and the lieutenant governor presided with the permission of the senators. And in fact, David Dewhurst at one point was actually taken out of the chair by the senators very quietly and surgically. And I think it stunned pretty much everybody uh, in the community, not to, not to mention the senators themselves, that they didn't revolt, um, uh, uh, have an open revolt and, and essentially um, uh, fight back on that. Um, and since that point, um, the uh, Senate has been docile, which is not something that we normally associate with the uh, Texas Senate. Um, the uh, Republicans pretty much fall in line um, he is constantly doing polling and showing them that uh, if they don't vote the way he wants them to vote on a specific issue, that um, uh, their primary voters won't like it. And it has proven to be very persuasive, that along with the, uh, uh, the power to punish by removing you from significant committees and committee assignments. Uh, the speaker, uh, but for the moment, uh, the, the lieutenant governor has been the primary driver of the process. Uh, the speaker, uh, we go back to uh, Joe Strauss, uh, who served for five terms as speaker. He was an accidental speaker. He was the product of a Republican chairman's revolt uh, that was supported by a broad uh, majority of Democrats. But it was the Republican chairman who uh, did not like the way Tom Craddock was running the House that um, authored and engineered the revolt. Uh, Strauss uh, is somewhat, well, he's um, uh, somewhat of an aristocrat. Uh, he is, uh, can keep all of these, this stuff at arm's length. Uh, he was personally assaulted. He's the first Jewish speaker in 140 years. Um, and that's not particularly a popular place to be in the Republican primary. Um, and, um, but uh, what he was notable for was simply ignoring Greg Abbott and Dan, uh, Dan Patrick when it suited his purposes. And um, he's the one who essentially put the kibosh on the bathroom bill saying, he was not going to be responsible for a single suicide of a single transgender because of some kind of legislation. Um, he finished his fifth term and decided it was time to move on. Um, but he had in somewhat restored the culture of the House where the, the uh, members ran the House. There was a sense of collegiality. Um, uh, the partisan uh, warfare was, I won't say it, it was always, it's always going to be there, but it was diminished fairly dramatically. Um, and uh, the trains ran on time. 
Uh, his big problem was that uh, he was most comfortable with uh, folks elected prior to 2012 to be his leadership team. And when we had a subsequent speakers race, one of the themes was to empower the, those folks that were elected post 2012. Uh, so you have, uh, as a result, Dennis Bonin, who had been there for 24 years, uh, unfortunately had an unfortunate mishap in terms of giving an interview with a, uh, um, somebody that frankly, nobody in the process trusts. It's amazing that he had an, what he thought was an off the record interview. Um, and uh, identified uh, uh, 10 Republicans, or his associate identified 10 Republicans they were happy to eliminate. And some of the old guard came and said they could no longer support him and essentially drove him from office. Uh, we now have um, Speaker Dade Phelan, a freshman, um, who is, um, uh, has had a number of opportunities to take control of the session. Uh, thus far has not demonstrated that. He has been reasonably fair with Democrats, uh, not locking the doors when they decided to um, uh, bust the quorum. Uh, but um, when the governor uh, vetoed Article 10, which is the funding of the legislature, and in my opinion, an assault on the separation of powers, and it was done somewhat gratuitously uh, and whimsically, frankly, he wanted to do it two years ago when he had everything that he wanted. Uh, there was an opportunity for uh, Speaker Phelan to uh, say, well, this is all very, all these items on the call are very interesting, but we're not doing anything until, um, until uh, we pass and sign the uh, funding authorization again. And um, um, uh, speaker actually told me that uh, he did not believe the governor would do that, would, be, would sign it. And I, my argument back was, well, that actually makes you even more powerful because um, you're, uh, you're the one now controlling the agenda. Be that as it may, he is, um, it, it was a very difficult session for any freshman speaker. We had COVID, we had a freeze, um, we uh, had um, uh, the, all the disruption of the, of the Trump um, uh, post-presidency um, and, um, and uh, the domination of uh, former President Trump of the current Republican primary voter. Um, and it's been proven to be a, a very difficult balancing act. Uh, but I'll just sum up by saying the 2017 session was an embarrassment to the legislature. Uh, as a result, uh, we had a surprisingly uh, large number of Democrats uh, unanticipated elected in 2018. The 2019 session was a really back to business of government session. Um, but uh, uh, the, the Democrats had $50 million to spend in the 2020 election and did not move the needle, which uh, eliminated the fear factor for the Republicans. And this socially conservative agenda has now pretty much gone uh, to extremes. And I'll simply end by saying that uh, of all, there's any number of bills that could be flashpoint bills, but at the moment, uh, SB8, the, um, I call it the uh, vigilante bill, um, where women are suddenly, and their healthcare providers are being targeted for uh, illegitimate constitutional um, uh, prerogatives has uh, broken through in ways that are just now beginning to manifest themselves. And um, uh, the governor is now at a 33% approval rating. I think Republicans are in some jeopardy, even though they're going to draw the maps. Uh, 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 if Republicans lose suburban women, they lose. And, um, and we're on the cusp of something like that happening, even though they're going to control redistricting. And with that, I'll pull, pull my horns in and we'll go from there. <laughs> Thank you so much. I mean, I think that that is a really great overview and, and gives some of our members who maybe haven't been watching the legislature nearly as long as you have an understanding of where we are. We'll be interested to hear if any of our other panelists have comments on that as well. Um, and I just want to remind everyone that you can put questions in the Q&A, go down to the Q&A box, and then we're going to take a general Q&A at the end of our session here. Uh, let's go rapidly next to a member of the legislature who lived through this session so far, uh, State Representative John Busey, and uh, webinar controllers, if you would pull up uh, Representative Busey's uh photo there and put him on the spot here 
<laughs> we really appreciate your time here. I mean, I know you're in the midst of a third special session and this has been a tremendously impactful one on your life and all the people that you live and work with. And uh, we really appreciate your being here today and also appreciate your ability to reach across the aisle. And I wanna remind everyone, Harvey mentioned he wasn't being partisan in his observations. The league is strenuously nonpartisan. We try our best to do everything we can to serve the voters of Texas and enable them. And uh, I'll turn it over to you, Representative Busey. Uh, been a member of the legislature now for two sessions on the elections committee, both of those sessions. That's that's not a an enviable position. I don't think that some, the, most of your peers have. And we really appreciate your being here today. Well, Cindy, thanks so much for having me. Harvey, listening to your, your background, it makes me uh, think of a comedy of errors kind of with the way that the Texas legislature works. Um, not all of it great, but I, I tell you what, it's an honor to serve in the legislature. Uh, two terms now. I uh, would love to continue serving. I'm running for re-election. I, I just find the opportunity to get to be uh, at the heart of policymaking and working with all of you uh, uh, such a impactful and powerful experience. And so thank you all uh, for the opportunity that I've been given. I used to be county party chair in Williamson County, one of these suburban areas that has seen a lot of change um, that Harvey was talking about. And uh, in that role, you help put on primary elections. You learn the behind the scenes of how elections work. And that's what led me when I got elected to ask uh, to be on the elections committee. In fact, I sat down uh, with then Speaker Bonin and I told him, you know, I think a lot of people go in and ask for state affairs and appropriations. And I said, I want to be on elections. And I think at the time, very few people is usually where people got sent, not where they requested. And so he told me in that meeting that he would make my day. And uh, so I was thrilled to be put on there. Um, I think he used profanity, but I won't use that now. But he, he, uh, he, I think he was excited to have someone that wanted to be in that role and, and be a part of that process. And, and I again asked for it this session. Um, I think it's so important. I, I think at the foundation, and this will kind of lead the conversation as we talk about quorum break and other things, but I think foundationally protecting voting rights, expanding voting rights and increasing access to voting rights uh, has to be foundational and has to be the number one issue. I think uh, I've been asked many times, well, now will you break quorum for any item and, and the answer that I've been saying is no, you know, we, as Texas Democrats, we've become, become used to losing battles on policy in the legislature. But what's different about when it comes to voting rights is if you, in, in our opinion, if you manipulate the system where it's not fair, then all other issues cannot be fair. So, so if we want to have honest representation in the legislature that reflects the people of Texas, we have to first have foundational protections to voting access and voting rights. And so that's why it's such a such a priority issue, because um, it impacts all other issues. I want to say, start off with the, the regular session. You know, we, we did some good this session, and, and I appreciate you pointing out working across the aisle. I think anyone in this role, but also anyone joining this today, if you're going to be an activist, if you're going to be down there advocating for issues, you've got to be able to work across the aisle. You've got to find friends, in the Democrat and Republican caucus. You've got to find staffers in those offices to work with. Um, and you can't, I find at least, it's best effective to not hold grudges. So when I, when I have a bill from an author that I don't like, I don't let myself personalize it around that author. And, 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 I, and I'm saying all this to talk about my relationship with Senator Hughes, who you know, carried uh, Senate Bill 7, uh, the bill that led to quorum break, and, and this voter bill that we, we fought um, extensively, but he's also who I worked with to pass House Bill 1382. Uh, he was my Senate sponsor. This was uh, the ballot by mail tracker piece of legislation. It's something I filed in my, as a freshman. Um, we didn't really get any movement. I think because the pandemic, certain counties adopted similar policies. People saw it in action. And just think of like any of your packages that you order from Amazon or anywhere else, you can get online and track where it's at. That's kind of what this bill does. It allows you to monitor and track your ballot by mail. We actually went further with some legislation in the special to let you do some corrections on it. Um, but this was something that I worked with Senator Hughes on. And, and I think it's important to when you find a good idea, um, 
to find find bipartisan support for it. And, and I thank the League of Women Voters who advocated for that piece of legislation. Uh, our election administrators and our clerks came down and advocated for it. And we saw, uh, you know, Republican and Democratic caucus support for it, leadership from the speaker to the lieutenant governor, Senator Hughes, and, and on up. And it was a piece of legislation that I think was one of the high water marks when it comes to election policy this session. And, um, you know, and so I, I think that's just a great example of how we can work together and we can get some stuff done. Uh, just to run through some other uh, good wins, I think this legislative session, uh, Senate Bill 116, we put House Bill 2860 into it, which is just more notification, uh, included notices of election, polling place locations, and other critical information when it deals with local jurisdictions, something we had done the previous session for statewide information and county, but now with local elections, this is just more access uh, to information to help with our shared goals, I think, of increasing access to the ballot box. Uh, we saw I think it's uh, Senate Bill 598 is important for us all to keep on our minds right now. This deals with risk limiting audits. It's a national best practice to ensure integrity of elections. So I think as we're going through this ongoing conversation uh, from the governor's office on down about audits and, and what we're hearing um, across the country uh, tied to the 2020 election audits, you should know that we passed a bill already this session that will follow best practices on how to do audits of elections moving forward. Um, so often right now, I think we're seeing partisan politics get in, come into play with these audits and, and that's uh, frustrating. And I think, um, you know, takes us backwards. We have this bill in place in a bill 598 uh, to work on that. I think when we look at where kind of things got off the rails this session, you, we need to first know where we started from. And we started with the secretary of state's office um, Secretary Hughes herself talking about it during the midst of the pandemic and COVID-19 that this election was incredibly successful. It saw the largest turnout in 28 years. Um, that's a win, even though that still leaves Texas way underperforming where we all want us to be as far as civic uh, engagement. We were seeing major progress. We had the Secretary of State's office come to the elections committee hearing and talk about how the elections were uh, run smoothly and securely and that they were a success. So I think that's the foundation that um, my I started with for this legislative session, thinking, well, if these were so successful, then let's look at how we continue to grow that pattern. Unfortunately, that success and that those statements from the Secretary of State were met with what I would classify as voter suppression bills. We had 65 bills filed this session that would make it harder for people to vote. 65 bills filed in Texas, that's more than North Carolina, Georgia, uh, Florida, and Arizona combined. So you're talking about a major attack on access to voting uh, this legislative session that ultimately culminated with SB7. Um, now, it wasn't an all, all a loss. And, and I think back to the start, uh, we have um, to continue to work across the aisle even when we're frustrated. I think when we were looking at the earlier versions of SB7 in the regular session, the House did that. The Texas House uh, worked in good faith, put on a bunch of amendments the night that the bill was on the House floor. Unfortunately, when that bill came back from the Senate, there were significant changes done in the, you know, the dark of night, final hours, um, that not only changed the bill back from our amendments, but added on new provisions, which received a lot of attention, such as, you know, limiting the hours in Sunday voting, which will be a you know, which was a direct attack on souls to the polls. It also had lowered threshold to overcome, overturn election results, things that we had never dealt with in hearings or, or, or had public testimony on. Um, so, you know, we, we in the House felt we were met in bad faith from the Senate. Uh, part of that is what led to the quorum break, I think. Uh, and, then, and then what's led to the ongoing quorum break is a lack of trust now between the House and the Senate and feeling if we negotiate something in good faith, knowing we're coming from a weaker standpoint of being the minority party, but if we negotiate in the House, will it be respected in the Senate? And, and that's led to a lot of this uh, long summer that now leads us to our third special session. Um, and you know, and the fight fight is ongoing. Cindy, I'm, I'm not quite sure how much time I have left, but I wanna, few minutes. I just wanna transition to kind of where we are and you mentioned it's our third special. Hopefully it will be our last special. Obviously we're dealing with redistricting, which is vital and has a major impact on, 
you know, ballot access and elections. Um, and I think people feel, feel beat down right now after these specials and, and the legislation that was passed that contradicts the secretary of state's office contradicts the honest landscape of where Texas is on voting. And, and we also know that there's, you know, pro provisions in this bill that was passed in the second special session that will make it harder for people to have access to the ballot box. And that, that takes us backwards. So where, where do we go? We have to stay hopeful. We have to stay inspired because uh, I think these challenges um, are hard and, and we know that we can get there. I think uh, Cindy will probably be able to testify to this group that she can walk in a Democrat or Republican's offices, find the right staff members, sit down and talk about a best practice policy and you probably win people over and change hearts and minds. And I feel like we do the same thing, such as this ballot by mail tracker that I filed two years ago and couldn't get a hearing on to now major bipartisan support working with, you know, Senator Hughes and myself. So I think, I think we have to stay hopeful that we can continue to move, uh, move towards progress of, you know, fully accessible ballots, which is our goal. I think uh, to do that, we have to keep talking about what are best practices from other states. Let's keep talking about how online voter registration not only increases access to the ballot box, but also increases security around voter registration. Um, so that's a vital thing. And I think the longer we have that conversation, the more success we'll find. I will say just in my conversations from January to now, we are seeing bipartisan support uh, quietly behind the scenes for legislation like that. So we need you all to keep having those conversations about why it's not only good for increasing access, but also for security. Let's just think through our narrative of how, how to accomplish those dual goals um, that I think is what leads us to success. We need to look at legislation um, for uh, disabled individuals to be able to vote. Uh, we, we've had lots of testimony over my two terms in the legislature about how to do that. I filed a bill that would use um, a current system that we use for military overseas where the ballot is emailed, you use your computer to fill out the ballot, but then you print it out and send back a physical ballot. We have legislation that would expand that to the disability community. Uh, we've heard testimony after testimony that says the safest and most secure ballot is one I can fill out myself. And that's what this legislation would enable. Think about maybe someone uh, who does not have sight using their technology through their computer to fill out their ballot in privacy, not relying on an assistant, and then submitting that and, and printing it and, and mailing it back in. I have legislation for that. During last special session, we had Republicans even file amendments to SB7 to do that legislation. So that's my point. If we stay hopeful, we keep having honest conversations, uh, myself, peer to peer, colleague to colleague, you all with best practices, we're moving the needle when we have those one on one interactions because it was testimony from the disability community that is making us get headway on that type of bill. In fact, I think it was called out that I had that bill. We've now got Republicans that support that bill publicly and have even filed, like I said, amendments for it. So I think it's just over the horizon that we're gonna pass legislation like that. So I, I, feel, I feel optimistic and positive that if we don't give up, if we don't get deterred by what we see as some setbacks in policy, that we will continue to win, you know, to move the needle and ultimately win the day and make Texas a leading state on voter access and make Texas a leading state on participation. So that's, that's what we have to all do. And uh, from the grassroots standpoint, you guys truly lead the way. League of Women Voters, I'm, I'm impressed. Y'all never seem to get deterred. So it's that spirit that we, we all need to follow. You're there at three in the morning, four in the morning, five in the morning, waiting to testify, to tell the committees how you feel about a policy. Um, and it, to me, it's encouraging and it's inspiring. And then I know you're going to be out there doing voter registration and doing every bit you can through, through uh, you know, forums and other ways to let us know about policy for your candidates. All of these are tools that increase access. So I, 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 I'm so inspired by League of Women Voters and how diligent y'all are. And I, and I just want to help uh, any way I can as we work towards our shared goal of increasing civic engagement and participation and ultimately, um, like I said, making Texas a leading state on participation in the voting process. Thank you all for having me. I look forward to answering some questions. Thank you so much, Representative. And viewers, please put your questions in the Q&A and we'll try to get to those as soon as we can. Um, I'm gonna 
We really appreciate your mentioning online voter registration. That's been our number one goal since I've been involved, uh, and it was a couple of sessions before that. I don't know that I've testified on any bill uh, that I haven't mentioned online voter registration, regardless of what the topic was, because it is a extremely important. Accuracy, security, uh, and all the other reasons. Uh, so. Uh, let's jump right ahead to someone who represents that group of people who have been affected as much as anyone else in this last year, and that's the elections officials. We're so pleased to have uh, Isabel Longoria with us today from Harris County, who uh, is election administrator number one, uh, first one in Harris County, uh, where previously the uh, county clerk and the voter registration was under the, uh, much like here in Travis County, the tax assessor collector. So Isabel uh, has distinguished herself in many ways and was very involved. Uh, if you, if the Zoom controller will bring up uh, Isabel Longoria, please, uh, was the one in charge of all of the improvements and ways to deal with the pandemic and all the other things going on this last uh, 2020 election. So Isabel, thank you so much for being here today. Uh, we appreciate your positive outlook as well and look forward to hearing from what you have to say today. Thank you. And uh, I'll, I'll lead off by saying that here in the Houston area, I was a uh, League of Women Voters rising star, joined the board and was very active in the voter's guide and helping it uh, get translated into Chinese and Vietnamese here in Harris County since uh, we have four languages that people can vote in. So I am a big, I don't know what we call ourselves now, a, a league head, a, uh, yeah, a leaguer, uh, a woman of, woman of voting, but uh, it's that passion that ended up leading me to, it truly is a surprise, a surprise for me, um, uh, applying and getting appointed to be the first elections administrator of Harris County. Um, I did work under interim clerk, county, uh, county clerk, Chris Hollins, um, for the November 2020 presidential. So when we put in drive-through voting and the 24-hour voting, um, and people don't even know, we actually changed and color-coded our mail ballot envelopes so that they were easier to use um, to the point that our mail ballot program improved. And again, putting in a cure system um, that Representative Busey, as he said, you know, was a best practice that we learned from Bastrop County actually in mail ballot tracking that is now being promoted as a best practice across the state. So we're proud to be one of those first counties kind of working through the kinks. Um, one of the uh, results of that is that our mail ballots uh, rejection rate went from an average of 11% to every election to 0.03% for the November 2020 presidential election. So that's about 10% of mail ballot users that our signature verification committee, a bipartisan committee, were able to reach those folks, to call them, to send them letters, to get them to come in and correct errors, or if they couldn't correct those errors, encourage them to, you know, that, to go vote in person so that their vote counted instead of being thrown out for what is obviously human errors. And that's kind of a big theme that I saw during the Texas legislature is one, um, there are human errors. Let me be the first to break it to you. With 800 presiding judges on election day in Harris County, over 11,000 election clerks and workers, there are human errors. But human errors that have been happening for every election that we have systems to catch where we retrain people on the spot and constantly improve our processes to the point that for every election, we have Department of Justice inspectors, we have Texas Secretary of State auditors, literally in our central count area for the November presidential election. We have people from the Attorney General's office, we have people from the County Attorney's office, we have poll watchers. Um, and that was a, quite a bunch. We even had the media there with cameras for the presidential, but we get that every single election. Uh, Harris County, we do our, uh, our uh, logic and accuracy test, which is the three mandated tests, three logic and accuracy tests that you have to do for every election. For every election, there's something called a, a, what we call a partial manual count, so manual counting, where the Secretary of State delivers um, basically a set of precincts and a set of races and says, go back, hand count, you know, even before uh, we went to a paper ballot system in Harris County, you had to hand count the mail ballots. Make sure that what you reported election night is what you get when you hand count those ballots. And in Harris County, we're there. We comply. 
um, per Representative Busey, uh, that new bill about risk limiting audits, Harris County has voluntarily opted in to be a mega county as part of the pilot project to figure out risk limiting audits for the rest of the state. And so I say that all to say, you know, I'm sure you all know, we have now another audit, surprise audit that was announced Thursday evening. Um, we still don't have details about it from the Secretary of State's office. Uh, I think everyone, including us and the other big counties are, are waiting who got selected for it. And really the sense I get is at what point are we going to be done with November 2020 and recognize all of the elections that have happened since then and all the elections moving forward. So I'm taking the stance very much so that one, I need to know what exactly the audit is because it's my job to protect the voters of Harris County. And so I am literally allowed, not allowed by law to just open up the boxes and say, go touch whatever you want and look at whatever you want. There are very limited circumstances under which we can open the election records ever without a court order for people to inspect them. I don't know if that's what the Secretary of State is looking at, what laws they want to do said audit, or if they're just kind of using it as a new umbrella term because it's the you know happy word of the day um, to go back and say we want to reassure people that November 2020 was executed absolutely to the standards um, that the Texas Election Code dictates. I have no doubt that the Harris County election was run smoothly, but the question is how do we put this to bed? Is this the audit? If something comes out of this, is this going to be used again to create more conspiracy theories and more audits and more investigations and more inspections? At what point do we say enough is enough? The elections has ha have happened. All the audits, all the checks and balances, all the folks who have come through who feel satisfied are satisfied. And the only remaining folks who don't like the answer that everything was fine is the conspiracy theorists. And quite frankly, I think people trying to spin this uh, per Harvey Kronberg's, right, into some kind of election message or who knows what for the upcoming primaries. So that's where I'm getting exhausted, is at what point do we put November 2020 to rest? Because I've had the December 2020 runoffs, the first as the elections administrator, went off with a hitch. We implemented new voting machines in Harris County, so touchscreen paper ballot voting machines in three months. It is the most machines in the shortest amount of time that our vendor, Hart, has ever done across the county. And we did it successfully for the May elections and continued using drive-through voting and continued sending mail ballot applications to voters over 65 and did our expanded hours and created uh, the mail ballot kind of cure process and tracking system and had a phone line where if you as a voter had any question, had any concern, wanted to report any poll watcher for anything, you could call us and get immediately connected to the county attorney's office to escalate that and investigate it within a matter of minutes. And we did our mail ballots improvements, right? That made it mail ballots easier to use that have that color coding system and went to the legislature to fight against all these wild, again, conspiracy theory based laws and tried advocating for things like online voter registration and by the way, online mail ballot uh, applications. So again, mail ballot applications, you have to print, you have to have a printer and internet and find a stamp and mail it in. And you have to redo those every year per state law. So all of that, we hosted the May elections, and I'll, I'll take a nerdy point here. If you thought it was impressive that for a presidential election, which are always the most popular elections in our country, we hit 68% of our uh, registered voters come out, which is 1.65 million voters in Harris County. That's all good and well, but there's always, you know, kind of presidentials always get a lot, especially contentious presidentials. It's almost not impressive to me. What is impressive as an election nerd is that all of those uh all of those innovations that we implemented in the May elections, which was our local cities, some of our school boards, some of our mud districts. I mean, the true things that represent and control the water you drink on a daily day basis, who takes out your trash, all that good stuff. There was an average of 4% turnout and we almost doubled it to 7.4%. Doubled it by using all of those innovations, a large majority of which was mail ballot voting because for the first time ever, people got a mail ballot application not because a campaign decided that they would be a good voter, not because they already knew about mail ballot voting because they had an education and access to internet and printers and stamps and transportation to mail things out because they solely were a voter over 65. And I believe that everyone has the right to be educated on their rights to vote, those methods of voting and decide for themselves what are the best opportunities to vote without bias from a campaign, from a true nonpartisan source like me as an elections administrator. 
And that's the spirit that I'm taking into November, 2021. You know, you wanna keep doing an audit about last year, go ahead. Uh, I'm excited to announce that on Tuesday, Harris County uh, uh, will be putting up for uh, consideration by the Harris County Commissioner's Court that we're gonna be offering a voting location for the first time in Texas in the Harris County Jail because there are people who have been denied their right to vote just purely because they've been detained on speculation that they might have committed a crime. The only other city that I know of that has done that is Chicago. And I'll be truthful, even previous administrations in Harris County have made up excuses that it couldn't happen because it was a difficult project to implement. But I consider that my job is to jump through hoops so voters don't have to. So, you know, I get a lot of how do you stay positive? How do you, you know, what motivates you to do this, et cetera. There's no magic bullet. Uh, what motivates me is doing a good job as a public servant, um, implementing the projects that I want to see, that I think uh, all voters want, uh, that you as taxpayers want to know are happening. True innovation and innovation in not even being creative ideas, just learning the other creative things people are doing and making it happen in Harris County is an incredibly low bar in Texas right now, unfortunately. And so to me, not doing it is worse, right? Not doing it means we have people who are denied their fundamental right to vote. Not doing it means we leave people out of the system that have been historically left out over and over and over because it's too hard to solve that problem. That's my freaking job is to solve the hard problems. Uh, and I enjoy it and I love it. And even when I hear about lawsuits and audits and whatever, it just means someone has a question and I'm here to have the answer. So uh, I'm pretty pumped. I'm not gonna stop until someone removes me. And even then I'll try and join the League of Women uh, Voters in Houston and keep advocating for all these things. So uh, that's how I keep my positive attitude. It's an absolute pleasure to serve here in Harris County. I'm in my dream job uh, and I just can't imagine doing anything else than pushing the boundaries because for me, the result again is protecting the fundamental aspect of democracy, which is free, fair, and accessible and safe elections. And if we don't do that, to represent Busey's point, um, then we kind of destroy everything else that happens in the democracy if we can't trust the elections and who we represent into those offices. So I'll stop on that happy note and uh, pass it over to Mr. Busey Clancy here, uh, who I'm sure feels just as impassioned. Buser Clancy, sorry. Thanks so much, Isabel. Uh, we really appreciate your uh, voicing what the League of Women Voters is all about and uh, appreciate your being such a big champion of that. And we will go to our uh, last uh, panelist here today. You may not have heard Thomas Buser Clancy's name before, but you certainly do know about his work. And if we could have the uh, Zoom pass over to that. Um, Tommy has been a great friend to the League of Women Voters since joining ACLU in 2018, uh, as he's been involved in the lawsuits that uh, the current one that we've just filed in association with uh, the disability community statewide and other organizations against SB1, and also was played a role in the 2019 uh, effort to um, of the Secretary of State to remove uh, about uh, 10,000 voters, I oh, 100,000 voters, excuse me, in 2019. So we've asked Tommy here to talk about the perspective of the legal community in defending voting rights and election laws here in Texas. Thank you so much, Tommy, for joining us today. Thank you, Cindy, so much for having me. Um, it's always a little dangerous to end on a happy note and then pass it on to a lawyer, <laughs> but I'll, I'll, I'll do my best. Um, as, as Cindy noted, it's you know been an honor to work alongside and to represent the League of Women Voters in a variety of challenges to ensure that everyone in Texas can have their voice heard through voting. Um, and it's an honor to be here along with these other distinguished panelists. Uh, in addition to the work that uh, Cindy's flagged, I, I did want to mention that with the ACLU of Texas, we also represent Crystal Mason and Hervis Rogers in their criminal uh, cases for alleged illegal voting. Um, and in both cases, those individuals at worst committed an innocent mistake regarding their eligibility and are facing years behind bars. Um, and I, I mentioned that representation because 
a lot of the discussion about election bills occurs in hypotheticals. Um, but when you have an election bill like SB1 that starts to add more and more criminal aspects to running elections, to uh, helping people vote, to voting itself, um, the consequences are, are not hypothetical. Uh, those, those criminal offenses uh, wind up with individuals facing real jail time. Um, and and it's, a, it's a scary moment to have offenses like that included in a bill that just came out of the legislature. Um, so I think that, you know, there's been some discussion of what happened during the, the sessions. Uh, we started out with what was called SB7, which was um, substantially worse than SB1. And there was a lot of advocacy surrounding um, a variety of provisions. And, you know, in, in conversations with reporters and other individuals, they always say like, list your top five bad things about SB7 or SB1. And the problem is that these bills are 60 to 80 pages long, and they really do drastically change the election code. So if you list your top five, the next five changes that are bad uh, are just <laughs> are just around the corner, and you really feel like you're leaving something out. It's it's really hard to understate um, the the damage that SB seven was going to do, um, and, and then some of the bad things that remain in SB one. Um, but there was a lot of work by the advocacy communities, by the League of Women Voters, um, by Isabel Longoria, um, and a lot of great work by legislators, including Representative Busey, to remove a lot of particularly egregious provisions from the bill. Um, Representative Busey mentioned this souls to the polls provision that kind of sprang up out of nowhere at the end of the regular session. But there had been a negotiation back and forth about what are the hourly constraints that are going to be put on early voting. Um, and, you know, it's our position, I think the position of a lot of people here that counties shouldn't be told what hours they can conduct early voting. If they decide they want to do it for 24 hours like Harris did, they should be allowed to. Um, but there had been this back and forth and um, some time periods have been settled on. I think it's roughly what we see now in SB1, 7 a.m. to 10 p.m. And then out of nowhere, there was a drastic decrease on that just for the Sunday of early voting. Um, and, and it seemed to very particularly target black voters who engage in souls to the polls coming from church to go vote. Um, and the outcry to that, uh, which occurred right around the time of corn break was, was extreme, um, both in terms of it being you know, a bad idea, but also clearly illegal to target a particular group of people um, and, and their voting practices, and, and that has been removed. Um, and I'll name one other egregious provision that has been removed, I think, through advocacy and pointing out uh, problems with its legality, and that is in the original drafts of many of these bills, the, uh, the bill would have banned the ability for someone who needed assistance to get assistance from anyone who encouraged them um, and there was a very real fear that that would prevent parents from using their children as assistance because in a very normal interaction, you would have, uh, you know, a, a child like a 18 year old, 19 year old saying, mom or dad, you should go vote. Bring me as your assistant. I will help translate. I will help you with whatever you need. And that ban on encouragement um, coupled with criminal provisions you know, had an extreme likely effect of preventing parents from using even their children. And there was constant discussion of how this was not only a bad idea, but blatantly illegal. Um, and it eventually was removed uh, sort of at, at the last minute. Um, so it is, it is fair to say that over the course of, uh, of its iterations from SB7 to SB1, many bad provisions were removed. Um, but we're still left with a bill, SB1, that uh, makes it harder and scarier to vote, particularly for individuals with disabilities and communities of color. So the bill has passed and it's been signed by Governor Abbott. And that means we move on to the next stage of uh, some bills' lives, which is its challenges in court now. Um, and as Cindy mentioned, uh, the ACLU of Texas, along with uh, the Texas Civil Rights Project and other organizations. We represent the League of Women Voters, 
uh, rev up top um, and some other organizations in a challenge to SB1. Um, and this is one of four challenges to SB1 that's occurring in federal court. And there's actually one additional challenge to SB1 that's occurring in state court right now. So um, many, many community groups, uh, grassroots groups, uh, groups that work with particularly individuals with disabilities, uh, uh, Hispanic voters, Black voters um, have seen SB1 for what it is and, and filed suit. The federal lawsuits are in before a judge in San Antonio. Um, it's in an early stage of litigation is what I would say. So there's not you know anything to report on likelihood of success or things like that, though we think that our arguments are very good. Um, and so what I'll, what I'll just spend a little bit of time focusing on at the end here is some of what uh, we're challenging in our lawsuit to give you a, a sense of some of the provisions that are included in SB1 that, uh, you know, hopefully will be struck down. So I mentioned earlier that there was a provision that would have prevented people who need assistance from using anyone that encourages them. Well, that's been thematic throughout SB1 is trying to make it harder for voters who need assistance to actually get it. Um, and you just have to take a step back and ask yourself, okay, who in Texas and by federal law is entitled to assistance? Those are voters with disabilities and they're voters with limited English proficiency, which in Texas uh, is Latinx voters, uh, Asian American Pacific Island, Islander voters. So when you attack the ability to get assistance, you are attacking uh, those communities. And the part of SB1 that, that made it in that still remains is there's a provision that limits the sort of assistance that voters can get and very particularly prevents an assistant to a voter from answering any of the voters questions. So it used to be in this oath that assistance would take that they would say, I'm limiting my assistance to this, that, and the other. And it included a phrase and answering questions. That phrase was explicitly deleted in the new bill that came out. Um, and so that prevents the honest back and forth between an assistant and a voter. And you, you say, well, these are voters who need assistance who might need to understand how do I operate this machine? You know, can you explain to me this instructions that I see? Um, or maybe they're an assistant who is translating for uh, the voter and there's a question about translation. You know, what did you mean when you said that about this ballot initiative? Uh, under the current provision, the assistant could not answer those questions and, and not only are they not allowed to under the oath, but it's now explicit in the oath that the assistant is taking it under penalty of perjury. Um, so we're adding all of a sudden this new threat of criminal prosecution if you uh, violate your oath. And as I mentioned at the beginning, those threats of criminal prosecution aren't hypothetical. They end up with individuals facing real jail time. Um, and we're talking about the uh, community of people who are assisting voters being faced with that, that's that's deeply disturbing. So that is one of the provisions that we're challenging in the lawsuit. And I'll mention one other, I know we're running short on time and wanna to move to a Q and A, but um, there's also a new provision for mail ballots that says when you submit a mail ballot application and your mail ballot, you have to write down your social security number or driver's license number. Um, and there are a few problems with this. And honestly, it's, it's a provision that in the legislature, things move very quickly. And I think if everyone had taken a breath, maybe they would have realized that this is not a bad idea and it's not going to be functional. Um, but as it got jammed through, <laughs> that's not how it, it worked out. And so you have to provide these numbers or you can say, I've never gotten a driver's license or a social security number. But this doesn't account for individuals who are in group homes or things like that, who maybe at some point had a driver's license, you know, have that number, but don't have any reasonable access to it, aren't gonna be able to provide it. So all of a sudden those individuals can't fill out that section uh, of the ballot application at all. Um, so that's, that's one problem with that provision. The, the second is that while they tinkered with the language, it still says that what you write down on your mail ballot application or your mail ballot has to identify the same voter as what was in your voter registration form. And the, the big question here is, well, let's say while I'm writing it down, 
I accidentally switch my two numbers. You know, I switch a nine and an eight. And then they're going to look back at the voter registration and it's closed, but it, does it identify the same voter? Does it not identify the same voter? There, there's not reasonable guidance and there's a substantial chance some counties are going to be rejecting individuals um, simply for, you know, writing down the wrong number or maybe the county official reads a nine as a four um, and then that individual gets rejected. Um, and there are some cure provisions uh, for the mail ballot itself, but those cure provisions are, are not really robust. So what this has added is this extra procedural hurdle um, that every mail voter now has to fill out that's filled with traps, <laughs> essentially, where you might have your mail ballot application or I think worse, your actual mail ballot rejected for something that has nothing to do with whether you're an actually eligible voter or, or anything along those lines. So that's a, another provision that, that we're challenging in these lawsuits. Um, and, you know, that is an ongoing, the lawsuits are ongoing and, and will play out over the fall. And, um, you know, some of these lawsuits play out over multiple, multiple years. So um, we're in the early stages, but we are optimistic that, you know, we believe that some of these provisions are blatantly illegal and we're optimistic that the court will, will hear the same. Thanks, Tommy. I'm gonna go now to the Q&A if everybody's wanting to join back in. Um, looking at the questions, the first one I'm gonna go to is regarding poll watcher training. And I know as, as Tommy has mentioned and Rip Busey has mentioned, there were many provisions in these bills that started out and were improved along the way. We went everywhere from poll watchers could take videos of people in the voting location to whatever. But as I, as I recall, uh, poll watchers in the last version are required to take training and that training is to be provided by the Secretary of State's office through uh, an online video, as I believe. The question is, who is going to train the poll watchers so they act within their legal limits? Is there a limit on the number of poll watchers who can be present at the polling site? Are poll watchers allowed to be armed when at the polling place? Uh, does anyone want to raise their hand on this one, Isabel? I'll, I'll take it real quick on the implementation phase. Um, already in, in law, and this hasn't been changed, um, any candidate or uh, campaign essentially uh, is permitted, right, to have poll watchers at any location, but there is a cap. You can only have two per entity, so two per, again, campaign at any one given location and only seven total, regardless of where they are, per county. So, you know, Rep. John Busey can only have seven total in the county at any given time and no more than two at any single voting location. Mm -hmm. um, it, it all sounds great, but there is actually not a tool right now, at least not one provided by the Secretary of State to track which poll watchers are at what voting locations. Um, and so that's something we developed in the presidential uh, internally, but I, I really feel for some of our smaller and mid-sized counties uh, trying to track that across the county. So there is a rule, the implementation of it is, is hard. Um, I think the, the training is gonna be the same way. I am absolutely thrilled that there's gonna be a poll watcher training. I think the election office is well poised at the Secretary of State to create that. But again, what is going to be our mechanism? Uh, I believe the Secretary of State is still developing, hopefully, some parameters around that, that we can check and verify that people have gone through that training um, so that we can clear them um, to be poll watchers in the county. So I think there's going to be a little learning curve there. Um, on guns, it doesn't matter now that we have constitutional carry and free for all now in Texas. The only person, interestingly enough, the only person allowed to have a gun on premise is the presiding judge from a quirk of them being a judge from the olden days. Um, but I will say at least in Harris County, very few, if any, uh, actually bring a gun uh, and no voters, no poll watchers, no election workers, no matter what are allowed to have a gun on the voting premise. And I will say, I think we had one of 800 in November who just really felt adamant about being armed as a presiding judge on election day. So um, stat wise, we're, we're pretty good there. Cindy, can I jump yes, in and please. just add, and all of that was uh, right on, and, and I just want to add to the point of working across the aisle and the role of advocacy, the poll watcher area of the bill, SB7, SB1, was 
I would say at the top of our concerns in the Democratic caucus. It was um, a lot of issues with the bill, but this area was number one. And, and I think it was a big part in, you know, why did we have quorum break and what would this lead to voter type of intimidation? Um, you know, earlier versions of the bill were going to allow you to have a free pass to intimidate, basically, because you would have to be witnessed and receive a warning and then be to be removed. Um, when this bill finally passed in special session two, it added training. And that was because of advocates like you all showing up and testifying. Um, and and my my colleagues across the aisle heard you and and they they bought into the training. And it was because I think of the constant pressure that the outside community gave. So that's that's just another win to the advocates of why this matters. And uh, as said, we don't know all the details of that training. Uh, uh, Representative Click carried that, you know, who used to be chair of the elections committee, and it's really led left up to the, the Secretary of State to decide to define it and 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 make the training. But my understanding is that you will once you complete it, you will get a certificate of completion, and that will be something that you use to prove your completion. It's also in the oath now um, when you show up to be a poll watcher that you have taken the training. So then you're swearing uh, in the oath. And I, and I also want to say getting the other, so that was a big change that we got at the end in the house. And another one was that someone, a poll watcher who gets out of line can be removed on a first offense. Those were two major hurdles um, that obviously we're not happy that this bill is law, but you talk about working across the aisle, you talk about outside pressure, um, it can make a difference. And these are two great examples of that. It might be helpful for one of you to reiterate who is eligible to appoint poll watchers. Uh, I don't know that everyone realizes that. Uh, I can do it quickly, although Isabel probably knows the answer better than I do, but I think it's basically any campaign or initiative on the ballot. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, in Austin, we, we had a big transportation initiative. That initiative could have had a poll watcher on site. Um, so anything tied to the ballot uh, and the parties can do it as well. So you know, the Republican Party, Democratic Party, Libertarian Party, they can have a poll watcher as well. Isabel, what did I miss? So. Okay, uh, let's go to, um, there are a couple of questions about this newly announced forensic audit. Uh, and uh, I think it's really important that we all uh, don't seem to know what that is. Uh, I think it's using terminology that's been used in Pennsylvania and Arizona, and it's just a catchphrase at this point. But they wanna know the difference between that and a risk limiting audit. And I'll first say that the League of Women Voters has been on the record for the last three sessions promoting a risk limiting audit as it relates to the election equipment security. And it's, it's also aimed at improving election equipment across the state. And this risk limiting audit is tied to that, uh, to a, a time in the future when all counties will need to use the most updated and secure election equipment possible. I, and if you want to speak to that, Representative Busey or Isabel or anyone else, Tommy, whoever else has something to add to that. No. Nope. Okay. Rep, you see, I think uh, it, uh, no, up to you to cover it, the Bill. risk limiting audit. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I think it's just important to know what you said earlier is this is a buzzword that um, is being used, but we don't really know what it means. We don't know what, you know, the Secretary of State's office, um, since we don't have a Secretary of State, said that this is going on, um, you know, all in this last week. We, we, I don't think any of us really know what that means. I hope it's not just me in the dark. Um, these other things we talked about earlier, the legislation of risk limiting audits, this is just looking backwards, making sure the system worked. You know, you're, you're making sure there was an intrusion in the system, that the paper and, and all the numbers add up and the machines work normally. The difference here that we're worried about, as Isabel pointed out, is without court order, you can't open all of these records. You can't do all that. So, so this buzzword being thrown around that's really tied to this national narrative around uh, the 2020 election you know, we don't really know what that means. I'm sure Isabel maybe can add a little more to that, but it's just kind of in the dark. And it's important to know the difference. Risk limiting is just best practice, making sure that the system worked normally. 
and nothing needs to be tweaked as we move forward to the next election. This other one is, I honestly, I don't know how to say this, um, trying to respect the nonpartisan. I think it's just tied to the big lie of, you know, who won the election and how and where. And we're just trying to find any example of fraud because, you know, as stated by the Secretary of State, these elections ran so smoothly and securely. So it's hard to understand what it is. Toss a political note in on, in on this. The speculation, of course, is that uh, the audit was ordered up as a way to placate former President uh, Trump um, and that uh, he had been demanding that uh, a full audit be placed on the call for the legislative session. Um, I don't think that the governor's office truly knows what it is, what the procedure is going to be at this stage. Uh, the great concern of the Abbott campaign is that if they don't fully satisfy the president, that um, there's an alternative candidate named Don Huffines, uh, who is to the right of uh, uh, Governor Abbott, and that it's not beyond the pale of, um, of possibility for the president, former president to withdraw his endorsement of Governor Abbott and, uh, if he doesn't fully comply or seem to comply and uh, throw that endorsement to uh, uh, former Senate State Senator Huffines. Um, and so, uh, this was done quickly. It was done. Uh, the announcement was made, made at evening in the evening, and I think they're probably scrambling to figure out what it is they're going to do, just as much as Isabel is. <laughs> yeah, Governor Abbott, I think on morning shows today, said that the audits have been going on for months at this point, um, which I think is news to a lot of people. Uh, yes. The, the only uh, other thing I would add is. Um, that you know, there's there's some discussion of when will we move on from 2020 um, in terms of these sorts of audits, but I think it's important to recognize that the the goal of just the you throwing around the word audit and constantly relitigating 2020 is a little bit about 2020, but it's also a lot about every election in the future and to plant the seeds that elections are never over. Um, and and that there there's there's always the ability to question them and then to you know make it so that in 2024 or some other time uh, if the result is not what's desired well then it's kind of normal now to to switch that out to relitigate it and that I think is really where the danger is of of these kind of freewheeling you know what we saw in Arizona sorts of mm -hmm. audits that are attempting to relitigate the election over and over and over again. Yeah, I, I know we're kind of jiving on this question. I I want to make a difference or point out something to you. Um, one, there is literally no definition that I know of in the Texas election code of a forensic audit. So it is a completely, as far as legally, a completely made up term. That is why we consider it a buzzword. I, as one of the four counties that will be audited, has, as of 3.42 p.m. today, have received no instruction on what that is. I would love to comply. All I need to know is where's my court order coming to open up whatever boxes you need me to open, but I cannot open that. I cannot open my books. I can't reveal anything to preserve the sanctity of the vote of Harris County voters until I get more direction other than a press release. But uh, I think there's been a fundamental shift too. We all know about hanging chads. That's like one of the first election things I remember. So disputing the results of an election is not new in the United States, right? You know, there's always people who are losing, who are right on the cusp, who, you know, want to make sure that the votes were done accurately, that whatever margin of human error can be accounted for, that, you know, we truly are squared away. The difference now is not contesting the results after they've happened, where you really have just a slim margin that could fall within that human error. It is even before voting started in November 2020, back in September, back in August, I had poll watchers. I had the attorney general coming out. I had the Department of Justice coming out. We already had the conspiracy theory, theory starting. And we had you know, lawyers from different parties on election night sitting at the party with us, scrutinizing every single thing we were doing, not from a poll watcher's accountability, but lining up what we knew would be a future lawsuit against us in questioning everything we were doing. And so that's kind of where the narratives have shifted, I think, for election officials. It's not your typical, okay, you know, there might be a loser and they want to make sure it's going all right. It's just even before voting started, right? It's, it must all be wrong. Um, and that's very frustrating to me as an election official. I have a question that's somewhat related to that. And the question is, what are the effects of not having a secretary of state on elections in general in Texas, since we don't, do not have 
someone in that position at the time. I know the deputy is, act, is the acting secretary of state currently. Does anyone have any comments on that? <laughs> Why not? I might get kicked out in two months anyway. Uh, I think the, the effect in, in the day-to-day -day operations is very little. You know, the deputy has the full authority to act on behalf of the interim. Um, I would take a stab. Maybe Harvey has more information on uh, who is jockeying to be secretary of state that is there now and then men might feel compelled to do certain things as well. Um, I think overall, though, you know, from a local perspective, it is good to have, you know, a state board and state oversight, not for the big counties like Harris County. We have over 160 permanent staff to carry out elections. I look at some of my peers next door who are carrying elections with five permanent election staff and volunteers. It is almost impossible for them to host an election without a secretary of state who can provide resources, who can provide those trainings across the state. So please take this to know that I'm, I'm not knocking on the idea of a secretary of state. Uh, what I'm knocking on is, you know, give us some more preparation. Let's actually do work and plan it out so that we can uh, make sure democracy is being executed correctly and not just this partisan ping pong ball back and forth. And I also, uh, the, the only other thing I would add is that from a democratic accountability perspective, um, you want to have a secretary of state that has been confirmed through the legislature. So what we saw in 2019 is that the failed voter purge uh, led to the acting interim secretary of state not being confirmed um, because there was, you know, such a backlash against this horrendous uh, attempt to, to purge voters. And then this year in 2021, there wasn't even, it seemed like a genuine attempt to confirm uh, the acting interim secretary of state Hughes. And now, even though there hasn't been a, a real secretary of state and we're in special sessions, there's Governor Abbott doesn't seem to be motivated to put someone up who would then need to be confirmed by the Senate. Um, and, and I think that we saw the same playbook in national politics where President Trump was saying, well, I actually much prefer acting or interim heads of organizations because they don't need to be confirmed. Um, and when you stop having the confirmation process, then whatever check, uh, even if it's you know secondhand where we elect the senators who then have to do the confirmation, whatever check the people have on the Secretary of State just goes away. Oh. I'll also uh, bring up, there are several people who have uh, posed questions regarding redistricting. And I'll say up front, uh, the League of Women Voters has a totally separate redistricting uh, uh, issue chair, and we're very active in the redistricting process. I'm not competent enough to respond to that, but let me ask a couple of these questions to see if anyone else wants to feel this question. Uh, one says, Senator Huffman, chair of the redistricting committee in the Senate, said yesterday that senators had to file proposed maps by today at 10 a.m. and that there would be voting on these maps uh, next week. That's not enough time to evaluate the maps. Is there no rule or guideline on how much time needs to go by before a vote occurs? Um, and there was one other, but does anyone... Uh, on the panel, feel uh, able to respond to the time frame or any of the details on, uh, especially Senate district maps, I suppose. I might uh, take a stab at this, and that is that uh, uh, the House is uh, actually been being more thorough and deliberative in the way they're going about doing this. Uh, and proceeding more slowly. The Senate has been a bum's rush from the beginning. Uh, the first view that the senators had of their map, they were uh, called into uh, Senator Huffman's office. They had an hour to look at it. They couldn't take a copy away. Uh, <laughs> the, um, they've redrawn uh, several, made several efforts to redraw uh, Senator Powell, Beverly Powell out of her district. And um, uh, it seems to me the theme here is that they now view the Voting Rights Act as completely toothless, uh, which um, obviously key provisions have been taken out of it, but they're going to uh, challenge the Voting Rights Act on any number of things. And when you look at uh, uh, Senator Powell's district, 
it went from being a as originally drawn or proposed by Senator Huffman. It was, if I remember correctly, a 52% minority district. It's now a 24% minority district. And according to Michael Lee, who's a redistricting expert, uh, where there is a possibility to draw coalition districts where minorities could have a say, um, that is still required by Article Two. Um, but uh, it looks like this is going to be a full court press. Uh, one last thing I'll say is that again, Michael Lee has pointed out that every redistricting cycle, the Legislative Council the law firm for the uh, legislature puts out guidelines. They haven't put out guidelines this cycle, um, and um, uh, Lee suspects that they're getting their advice from the Attorney General as opposed from Legislative Council, and Legislative Council is responsive to politics, but it is generally apolitical, and I'll leave it to your, your, your membership to draw their own conclusion about the Office of the Attorney General. Can I, I see one of the other questions talks about, uh, you know, any chance of getting like independent redistricting commissions in place. Um, I know, I think Rep Howard, Donna Howard was on earlier, or she's maybe just attending. She has championed this for most of the last decade, trying to get it done. It needed to be done before this session. We needed to get it done last session to get it in place. It didn't happen. Um, and if there's any way to go around that and do it now, I, I'll just say there, it's not going to happen. So to answer the question, it's not going to happen. It's something that we have to continue us to aspire to, you know, next time around, which is a decade from now. So this is going to be partisan. It's going to be bad. We don't have near the federal protections that we've had in the past, as, as Harvey just pointed out. Um, but it wasn't without Donna Howard's efforts and, and many others trying to, to do it, something I've also supported. But, but it's going to be done uh, fast in the Senate, as we're seeing. And I agree, it's been a lot more deliberative in the House. Uh, you know, the chairman, Todd Hunter, has been asking us all for input. Uh, there's been hearings just talking about our communities and, 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 and what they mean and, you know, so on and so forth. But we haven't seen his map yet, so time will tell how, how the House will handle it. But um, it's, uh, it's not going to happen this time. There will not be an independent redistricting in Texas. I guess that does bring up another question that maybe some of you want to speak to, and that's what's going on at the federal level with the two bills uh, that are still, I believe, in consideration uh, to make some changes. Uh, I'm not sure if the question is the possibilities for that passage. I know there's probably varying opinions about that and how it might affect Texas. Well, obviously, I'll, I'll, the quick answer is that unless one of the uh, couple of senators decide to change their vote on the uh, filibuster, uh, the odds are pretty slim that we're going to see any kind of uh, voter reform, uh, voting reform out of the uh, Congress. I find it ironic, however, they're defending the filibuster at the same time that the lieutenant governor, each time he loses a Republican, reduces the number <laughs> of members necessary to be able to bring a bill to the floor. Uh, he eliminated the two-thirds rule, dropped it down to three-fifths, and essentially now it's uh, virtually a majority plus one or two to bring, give permission to bring a bill to the floor. Uh, so uh, the, the contrast, the irony of protecting the filibuster in D.C. and surrendering the two-thirds rule, rule in the Texas Senate um, is, I'll just be polite and say ironic. Ironic. Thank you all so much. I do want to ask the Zoom person to bring up our last slide because it looks like we've got about two minutes. I want to thank the panelists. You've been absolutely terrific. And I, I want to give you uh, some resources to connect with the League of Women Voters of Texas website. We have, a, as uh, Mary mentioned earlier in our session, we have new resources to provide better website product and the League of Women Voters of Texas is already in, in uh, exposed theirs. It's up and running. So please go to League of Women Voters Texas, lwvtexas.org and you'll find all sorts of good information on advocacy, how to take action, to see information about all of our advocacy and issue areas and uh, for more detailed information on the priorities for voting rights and redistricting and any other of our uh, more urgent issues that we uh, get involved in, and that's public education, women's health, equal opportunity, 
income and immigration. But you'll also find on our website current information about how to vote in Texas. And that reflects these new bills that were passed this year and will always be uh, striving to present the absolute current election details. Certainly all of the, lead, all of the uh, counties in the state have websites and that's a really good way to find out what's going on in your county, wherever you are. So how to vote, how to help voters, current election details, you'll find it on our website and you'll find information about the county websites across the state too. I know it's time for me to turn this back over to Mary and I really appreciate the opportunity to be here today and thank you all so much for participating.